Hello, this is Julie Venners with another Lupus Foundation of America research update. We are reviewing studies presented at this year's American College of Rheumatology annual scientific meeting about new ways to manage lupus. One topic on everyone's mind this year is the potential impact of the flu. Dr. Sherry Crow, a research assistant member at the Oklahoma Medical Research Foundation, presented data on a study that looked at lupus patients' response to the influenza vaccination. In her study, 72 lupus patients who received flu vaccines over three seasons were looked at for their disease activity following vaccinations. We found that there are some individuals who are poor responders, so they don't respond well to the vaccine, and that these are more likely to be people taking prednisone. And we also found that some individuals do have flares after vaccination, but most do not, and that um, what we're trying to do is continue with these studies to see if we can predict who's going to have a flare and perhaps make an alternative where if we know you're going to be a low responder, we can withhold your prednisone before you get the vaccine so that you'll make a better response. Flu vaccines are generally safe for people with lupus if they receive vaccines that contain only an inactivated influenza virus. People with lupus and anyone living with them in their household should not receive a vaccine containing a live attenuated virus. Antiphospholipid syndrome is seen in about 30% of people with lupus. Antiphospholipids antibodies react with proteins in the blood and interfere with the normal function of blood vessels. This can lead to serious complications such as stroke, heart attack, and miscarriage. Dr. Lisa Samaritana, Associate Professor of Clinical Medicine at the Hospital for Special Surgery Medical Center in New York City, provided an update on this syndrome, including risk factors and warning signs that lupus patients should know. So we know that having a very high level of the antibody or having the antibody be positive every single time you check it as opposed to intermittently positive, those are things that probably predispose to greater risk. And the other important thing that's come out over the past several years in terms of recent research is that having other blood clotting risk factors makes a big difference. So for patients who have high blood pressure, who smoke cigarettes, who have high cholesterol, all of these different factors seem to work in an additive way. And so patients with these antibodies need to be particularly careful to avoid prolonged periods where they're not moving around could develop a blood clot in their leg, for example, to not smoke. They should not take oral contraceptives because the estrogen in that can increase the risk of blood clotting. Dr. Samaritana says research in animal models is looking at medications that might play a role in the future in improving treatment for this potentially life-threatening complication of lupus. A small percentage of people with lupus have persistent periods where they are serologically active, meaning they have elevated levels of antibodies to double-stranded DNA and decreased levels of complement proteins, but are presenting no symptoms of the disease. Researchers call these periods SAC, which stands for serologically active and clinically quiescent or quiet. 55 SAC lupus patients who were being treated at the Toronto Western Hospital were studied to determine whether they were experiencing tissue damage during these quiet periods. Dr. Amanda Steinman, a rheumatology resident at the hospital, presented the data. We looked at these patients and we compared them to lupus controls that were matched for age, that were matched for gender, uh, that were matched for disease duration, and for their slick damage index score at the start. And we looked at these patients going forward to see what would happen to them. So we looked at the slick damage index, which is a highly validated tool, and it looks at a number of uh, different, different areas of damage, such as kidney damage, such as uh, bone damage, such as um, skin damage, and so forth. Going forward as well as malignancy and we, we looked to see whether or not there was a difference and certainly there was a striking difference between this SAT group compared to the lupus controls in terms of the rate of damage and so that was reassuring in terms of not treating these patients during a SAC period because it seems that damage does not progress uh, at nearly the same rate, if at all. So in patients who have a prolonged serologically active and clinically quiescent period uh, the best way to approach these patients is to monitor them serially, clinically, and to observe for any evidence of active disease coming through, and not to treat with steroids or immunosuppressives during that time period. 
Dr. Steinman said that a good alliance between people with lupus and their physician should always be first and foremost, so patients are being constantly monitored for any hidden health problems. Long-term monitoring of the health of people with lupus can provide valuable information about the prognosis of the disease. Doctors can use this information to determine which tests to conduct and which treatments to prescribe. Securing data requires following a large number of lupus patients over time. One such group of patients is the SLIC cohort. SLIC stands for Systemic Lupus International Collaborating Clinics and is comprised of 1,500 patients from 30 lupus centers in 11 countries. Dr. Murray Urowitz, clinical director for the Center for Prognosis Studies at the Toronto Western Hospital, led a study to examine the effects of lupus disease activity over time. And what he learned demonstrates the need for new, safe, more tolerable, and effective therapies for lupus. The studies show that we control the disease pretty well. The disease gets quieter over a five-year period. That's the good news. The unfortunate news is that while the disease is getting quieter, the damage that has been caused by the disease and or its treatment is actually increasing. We showed that 25% of the damage in the first five years in lupus patients is from cortisone-related treatments, and, and another 25% is possibly related to cortisone. So if we want to make cortisone the really bad guy, we can say, almost half of all the damage that occurs in the first five years is due to cortisone. So the lesson from that is, yes, we're controlling the disease better, but maybe we're controlling it by using some pretty big gun treatment. And if anything, we, we've known we need more treatments for lupus. This confirms that sort of thing for us. Dr. Gierowitz is the 2009 recipient of the Evelyn V. Hess Research Award, presented annually by the Lupus Foundation of America. An important requirement to conducting lupus clinical studies is having validated tools to measure disease activity and having standards to ensure that studies provide reliable data. Dr. Michelle Petrie, director of the Lupus Center at Johns Hopkins Medical Institute, is leading two initiatives to update and revise two important instruments, the Selena Flare Index and the ACR Diagnostic and Classification Criteria. This original flare index worked very well, but it isn't sufficient for current clinical trials of new medicines for lupus. The reason that it's not sufficient is that it separated out severe flares from mild to moderate flares. We know, though, that most moderate flares require treatment also. Our original Selena flare index was really very simple. It was not divided up into organ systems. The current new index, in addition to defining both severe and moderate flares, also makes it possible to define flare in every single individual organ system. Thankfully, we've learned a lot since the early 1980s. We recognize now that we have to include many other organ manifestations than were in the original criteria. We also know that there are laboratory tests like low complement that doctors use frequently to help them both classify or diagnose lupus. Dr. Petrie says that the updated criteria will help make clinical studies more reliable by truly separating out people with lupus from those who have other autoimmune diseases. Dr. Petrie's efforts are supported by the Lupus Foundation of America's National Research Program. To learn more about our program, go online to www.lupus.org forward slash research. That's all for this edition of the LFA Lupus Research Update, and thanks for watching.